Okay, it's being uh, 2.30, th sorry, 1.30, the committee will resume with its examination of NBN Co Limited, and I will give the call to Senator Pratt. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to continue questioning in relation to uh, some of the issues around conflicts of interest when some of these uh, NBN Co's uh, uh, relationships with primes. So may I ask at the outset, for the benefit of the committee, what the SMAX dispatch platform is, please? So the Surface Max uh, uh, platform sits on an, another platform called Salesforce. And essentially, it's an app which uh, coordinates uh, workforce movements, if you like. So appointments are loaded in. Uh, so if I start at the, the start of the process, uh, there's a, an event, whether initiated by a retail service provider or the end customer, either for an insurance uh, job or for an activations job, mm -hmm. that's logged in NBN systems. It then um, goes into Service Max, and that essentially becomes visible to the technician of where they need to go and perf perform their work. It also, okay. sorry, it also provides them details about the problem, about the premises. Um, it's a way that they can record information health and safety information and information about the job, and it builds up information that MBN stores and can use at a later date. Okay, thank you. How much did it cost to develop and when did it go live? Okay, uh, I will have to take on notice the, um, the cost in terms of the deployment of the system. But it went, we, did, we started a soft launch uh, at the end of March in South Australia. We then progressively rolled out to um, Tasmania, then to Victoria, and uh, then at the end of April, we went to New South Wales. And we've, that's, um, they're the states we've rolled out in. Thank you. Can I can ask you to confirm some technicians have been waiting for hours to log on, synchronise and book off work. Is that correct? Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, with the rollout of the app, we did initially experience some problems uh, with the app. And it was based on the following um, reasons. The first one was there was a, a two-day platform outage that made the system unavailable to MBN and its technicians. The second issue was uh, there was a stability issue. So um, the app, to your point, it, it wasn't synchronising properly mm. and it wasn't stable. So how that would manifest itself if you were a technician in the field, you would be out there trying to complete your work uh, and the app wouldn't sync. So you, would, you were having a, a poor experience as a, you know, as a subcontractor. And the third one was more of functionality. We were getting uh, agile-based feedback from the subcontractors in relation to the usability, and we were working with them, you know, based on the feedback we were getting, to streamline the usability as we were rolling out the app. NBN's indicated the system worked well in initial states, but then ran into issues in New South Wales and Victoria. What changed? What changed was, or my reflection is, in South Australia and Tasmania, a much smaller volume of work that came in, uh, a lot more what I would say direct hand-holding, if you like, or um, work with the, uh, the, the technicians in relation to the changeover from one system to the next. We did initially see, because we then went to Victoria, we did initially see a usability and impact from a technician's point of view, but it very quickly recovered within one to two weeks. What happened when, literally, when it was rolled out in New South Wales, the platform went down and we uh, then had, uh, due to literally the doubling of the amount of work, uh, workforce on the system, we then had the, the, the issues around the functionality where it wasn't syncing properly. So therefore, it caused a, a poor experience for those. Um, what, is, what does a poor experience mean? Were people, um, did they know what work were they doing? Could they, yeah, uh, they, they, they would their work to, get, to be paid for it? That, I'd, I'd like, if possible, in that context, if you could explain at a high level the IT architecture of the workforce scheduling system. Is SMAX just the front end? Is it got Salesforce, ServiceNow, Oracle, what's at yep. the back end? Yep, absolutely. So, I'll, um, 
So the Service Max app sits on top of the Salesforce platform and it has a, a ServiceNow um, functionality in relation to scheduling and how work is coordinated and fed into um, the Service Max tool. Um, I think your other question, I'm trying to remember the other part of your question. Salesforce, ServiceNow, Oracle, yeah. So the it, architecture of it. Yeah. yeah. And so, okay. You know whether you've done any assessment of lost income or uh, hours lost time. You know when it costs time for people to use the system, were they reimbursed in any way by NBN Co for that? So first thing is uh, any work that was submitted to the uh, delivery partner and subcontractor that was you know for example because the app wasn't syncing and was unable to be completed will be paid for. So absolutely, uh, you know, that, that's uh, the arrangement. And secondly, due to the initial <coughs> functionality issues, which have now been resolved, uh, we have still brought in this, uh, I guess, this additional payment mechanism to subcontractors as they're getting used to the application and they're using that m more broadly. What's the actual cause of the latency and lag in the system? And why wasn't this an issue in the early phases of the rollout? Mm. I think it was really, it, it was a bit of a compounding problem with uh, the amount of users that we had on the system. And uh, again, and this is feedback that we received, we were, uh, we were loading a lot of artefacts in, in the field. Uh, and we were asking the sub subcontractors and delivery partners to use the app in a, in a uh, work front way. So we worked uh, very closely with our delivery partners and our subcontractors to really uh, refine that as we went. And that was always part of, of the plan. But again, when New South Wales was added overall, it, uh, it doubled the amount of contractors. Yeah, so at the back end you had Salesforce, ServiceNow, Oracle, were there any others, did you say? Uh, so uh, so it's, it goes Salesforce, um, uh, SMAX and ServiceNow, that, that's the, really the three parts. Oracle is more related to, to payments. If you could take on notice, please, you know, what each part of that system is yep, doing, sure. that mm -hmm. would be excellent. Um, yeah, and I think I, they're my questions now. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, Mr. Rue, can I start with you? I've got some issues around HFC speeds. Um, so, I want to begin by referring to, <coughs> excuse me, some recent correspondence from NBN users about the speeds that they are receiving over the HFC network. Um, I'll read out some segments of that correspondence. There's a lot of detail, and I'm also conscious of time. Yeah. So one user has not been receiving the gigabit speeds he had been paying for since March of this year. His HFC download speeds were previously able to reach peak and off-peak speeds of, uh, of close to uh, 900 millibytes per second, but suddenly dropped down to 30 megabits per second. The upload capacity remained unchanged. He's contacted his ISP over 30 times about the issue over phone and email. He has three different NBN technicians attend his premises. One technician told him that the problem was an NBN configuration issue and will be resolved in three hours. The ISP chased it up and that never happened. Another technician told the customer the problem was with the internet service provider. So the customer changed service providers and still had the exact same issue with slow speeds over the HFC connection. He's understandably very frustrated um, because on many occasions his ISP had not heard back from NBN regarding the issue. A customer, um, the customer asked for a senior technician from NBN to visit his house and NBN refused to do that. He's since called the TIO and there have been four different HFC outages in his area and the dates were listed at the 25th of uh, March this year, 29th. Uh, of March, 8th of April and the 16th of April. His ISP then advised him that they were due, that was due to software upgrades. Um, so Mr Roo, there's an issue in parts of the HEC network where it cannot deliver gigabit speeds. Um, firstly, if you could, can, when the hearing's over, can you share the correspondence with me please, Senator? I'll be... have to take that on notice, Mr Roo. <laughs> 
Are you, oh, well, if you, if you wouldn't mind, but um, I don't know whether John or John, if you can talk about this, the, yeah, the okay, speeds well. piece, but I think as well, if you want to talk I about mean, the I mean, I think ge geographically, <coughs> Senator, we need to know where that is. It, but it's a very simple question. Yeah. It's not specifically related to this particular issue, as I understand. It's really an issue, are there issues in parts of the HFC network where it cannot deliver gigabit speeds? Um, yes. There is. Because right. um, we're upgrading the network at the moment. So, right. but if so I that's just, the soft. Sorry, sorry to jump over you, but is that the software upgrades that his ISP advises? That um, that I, I don't know. I don't know what his RSP advised him. Right. But we're currently <laughs> upgrading the network right now, and we right. um, we're currently sitting at around 66% of the network that is one gigabit enabled, yep. and it'll be 95% by the end of the year. Now. There are a couple of factors in that question. Uh, one is um, really understanding geographically where that customer right. is. But and the second part is is that we there are outages on the network caused by a couple of things. Yeah. Uh, local power outages, which yeah. is significant. Okay. And also, as we do continue to upgrade the network, then uh, then there, there are outages, but we do advise customers in advance. Right. And, but and Senator, that, we, sorry, Mr. Sorry, sorry, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Senator Fur, sorry, I just, I just need sorry. to clarify. But this, this user used to be able to receive gigabit speed. So what... Yeah, I, I, until you look at the very specifics, it's really difficult to say. I mean, it, there is no rhyme or reason that they would have gone backwards. Right. So, um, so it would be great to have a look at that as a case okay. by case. So, right, Senator, so sorry, your, your question was, are there issues on the HFC network the, the, in terms of gigabit speed? That we are upgrading it over time, so there are areas that don't have gigabit speeds, yep. and there are areas that can get okay, up to gigabit look, I'm, speeds. So I'm it's not an issue per se; it's just a timing of upgrade. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, we're happy to provide the individual if, if case could, to MB and Co for your direct follow-up with the individuals, if you could. So, so, Mr. Rue, I now want to refer to correspondence from another HFC user, and they say, I've had NBN since it was released in my area. HFC is the technology used. I upgraded my speed last October from 100 megabits per second slash 40 to mm -hmm. 1,000 slash 50. Uh, it took my retail provider nearly two weeks to upgrade the speed from when I ordered it. Most of the time it would be fine. Sometimes I would have to reboot the uh, ARRIS modem as the speed would trickle down to about 400. Come March the 16th, 2021, nothing changed in his, at his place, but the NBN HFC connection has slowed to a trickle. Um, he logged a fault. The retailer sent out an NBN tech, but um, he would get several texts saying that the NBN fixed the speed issue and no need for an issue uh, for an appointment. Uh, so he'd then have to go through that process several times until the NBN tech came out. Six NBN technician visits later, two new ARIS HFC modems. The issue persists and has not been resolved and it's approaching two months now. The technicians changed the connectors, changed the isolator, checked the signals and they were all good. Each technician said the speed issue is with my retail provider. So eventually I changed retail provider for one week to test, but it was exactly the same issue. He then goes on to say, I'm tired and frustrated the amount of time that I've spent troubleshooting this uh, with, and I'm tired of all my retail provider asking me what the colour the lights are on my modem. I work in IT and this connection is not fit for purpose, yet I'm paying full price. I've now gone back to my original retail provider and the issue persists. My connection suffers from packet loss, dropout, slow speeds regardless of the time of day. It is not congestion as the speed issue happens at 2pm or 2am, the same thing. Apple TV, 4K speed test via Ethernet, hit, uh, used to hit 942 um, megabytes bits per second, now only about 40 or so. On my C connected via Ethernet, I would get over 945 download now. The results are shown below in the link, so he's got some links that he's provided us with. These results were 36 megabits, 46 megabits and 50 megabits. These tests are done via Ethernet, even connecting directly to the Aris box, same issue. 
there are a household of six people, two adults, four kids, one child's at university, three are at school, so they have a heavy usage, obviously. An MBN supervisor contacted them a couple of weeks ago saying that he would s send a field engineer, not a technician, and he will fix my issue. Several days pass and it's another field tech, not an engineer, changed connectors, changed the mode, tested signals and left. This didn't fix anything. They all say the same thing, including the NBN supervisor, contact your provider. So Mr Rue, I suppose I'll ask you the same question. Is there a broader issue with HFC at present that means that some parts of the network cannot deliver the gigabit speeds that users are paying for? Um, well, once again, there are areas of the country that is able to get get up to one gigabit speed, and they would have been sold to this particular customer. So the answer to your question is, if it's an area that is able to get up to gigabit speed, there is not a prevalent issue in the network. The, the, the experience that people are getting on HFC is good. Having said that, Senator, you just read out, and thank you for sharing that, a, a, an issue that a customer is having. And once again, until you actually get into the specifics, because it, it could depend on the home, it could depend on the street, it could depend on the modem they have, it could Why depend on, on a range of things. Check. So oh. if, 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 if you Sorry. could share that with us, we'd be delighted to follow that up yeah. and we will resolve I guess the issue the, for the And customer. I'm happy to do that, Mr Rowe, as you know. Yeah, I, I know you come can. with these stories almost every estimate. But mm -hmm. the, the issue is that it, it takes, mm -hmm. until we sit before you at an estimate, before people actually get their issues resolved, they're otherwise sent round and round the mulberry bush until they actually, we get an estimates and then I read out their story, <coughs> we send it to you and you fix it, which is great. But well, why do we have to wait for estimates well, to have that happen? So well, can I Well, you don't, you? Senator. You can send, if you get that correspondence, please don't wait to estimates. Send it any time, any time. But if I could just say that when we, when we look at the customer satisfaction on our networks, when we look at the number of complaints on our network, they're reducing, Senator, not going up. So... It's 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 not it's not a fair representation that that customers are getting a poor experience. It's actually the opposite. But there will well, be not issues sure that I agree in any that, in any in any technology. There will from time to time, no matter what the technology is, there will be issues. And our job, yep. quite rightly, Senator, is to when we when those issues are identified, to work with our retail partners to ensure that they're resolved. And this specific example, Central, it's, it's impossible for John or me or Catherine or Brad. I, I understand to that, but I guess what I'm raising, Mr. Rue, is yeah. the fact that um, I, I want to make sure that this isn't actually a broader issue that hundreds of HFC customers might be experiencing. Because not everyone has, yeah. you know, people give up. They give up complaining because they think, why would I? Yeah, no, the you know, the I've been through. From a I've been. The, the I've two, been through all that. The box. You know, people right. say I've been through all that and I've got nowhere. Yeah. I'm just going to throw my hands in the air and give and up. So I want to try and establish whether there are a lot of other people who are experiencing the same well, number of issues. I'll, so can I ask you on that? Yeah, of course. Do you have a dedicated teams for HFC service provisioning? Yes, we do. You we do. have. Um, Dedicated teams, not only... Can I ask you where they're located geographically? Yeah, all over the country, because right. the HFC network is predominantly in the major cities. So, um, so and we have... So we, sorry, when you say all over the country, are they located in capital cities? Capital or? cities, because yeah, okay. the, the HFC footprint is effectively in high-density yeah. yeah, uh, metropolitan right. areas. Yeah. Yeah. Are any of the teams located overseas? Um, the actual physical teams who support the network no. What about other teams? Um, in terms of some back of, yeah. back of house functions, so where a very are they? small number, yes, a very small number. But what? the actual core engineering... So where are they? Where are the overseas ones? Uh, they, they would be... Uh, we'd have a small team in India, but there are very few people. Right. Um, it, so that's the call centre you're talking about that's yeah, the based core overseas? The core, no, no, no. The core engineers... For HFC are here in Australia, right. as are all of the national field workforce who service the HFC. Yeah, but sorry, you said there was a very small team in India. Do, is that the call centre? No, no, it's just they just do they just do data Where is the processing. call centre? Do you have a call uh, centre? Gold Coast. Gold Coast. Right. As okay. Partially in Gold Coast and some are in Melbourne as well. So. Right, OK. Um, have any of the HFC provisioning teams been shut down? No. No? Is the HFC network having geographically isolated capacity issues? Um, no, the capacity of the HFC is, um, is actually being upgraded significantly, so the answer is no. 
Right. And what about um, people who do software and remote provisioning of uh, circuses? Where do they? Where are they based? Um, I'd have to take that question on notice. So you don't know? Not 100% sure, no. Do you know, Mr Roo? No, but we'll, again, the team yeah. will um, come back with hopefully the answer before 2.30. Yep, great. Um, are you aware of any software configuration issues with the HFC network? Uh, no, not directly. Um, beyond the, um, the upgrade that we're currently running across the network at the moment, no. OK, so... I guess you sort of touched on it before, but I just want to expand a little bit. Um, you talked about the particular areas where these people might be, but why would two very different households be experiencing a similar problem when connecting through four different retail providers? Um, again, you know, dependent on the specific location yeah, of those customers. Yeah, you did customers. say that. Yeah. yeah. Um, is that the only issue? Yeah, predominantly that should be the only issue. Yeah. Well, Just again, Sandra, we, we need we we well, I'm happy to feed you back the answers once we know, Sandra. But we we need the specifics. If the customers are willing to share it with us, we're very happy to to pursue okay. that and in, and inform your office of. Yeah, the well, outcomes. we will get yeah. that information yeah. Yeah. to you. So, yeah. thank you. Do the systems at MB Inco specifically capture service faults for circumstances where HFC can't deliver gigabyte speeds? We, we capture the customer ticket yeah. of work from the um, retail service provider and we Sorry, trouble the customer it. what works? So the customer will report that their, um, if they've got an insurance problem with the <coughs> outage, they'll report it to their retail service provider yep. and we will act on that ticket of work, yes. Right, but you don't actually capture that? No, the what we do box. do is we monitor all of the performance of all of the nodes proactively to see what speeds are occurring across each of the nodes. Are you able to tell me, and I'm happy for you to provide this on notice, how many HFC speed related service faults you've received since February 2021? We'll, um, we'll take that away, Sandra. Certainly yeah. there's, there's, we wouldn't have that. OK, well, I guess the reason I'm yeah. just wanting to make sure that there, it isn't a more systematic yeah, sure. problem, of course. So, um, OK, I've got some now on fibre to the curb. Um, <clears throat> So on the 16th of August 2018, at the end of the results call, um, NBN stated that I'm delighted to say that we're close to ending the testing phase and we'll, still, we'll shortly install our first G fast enabled DPU on the FTCC network. Um, Mr Morrow said that during the financial results call. We will be one of the first operators in the world to take this step on FTCC. What we are doing here is preloading the MBN network to be able to meet the bandwidth demands of the future with GFAST technology. It will, it will enable gigabit per second speeds over copper lines with the vast majority of the one and a half million premises on the FTT network to be GFAST enabled by the year 2020. So are the 1.4 million uh, premises that um, Mr Morrow spoke about back in 2018 on the FTTC currently GFAST enabled? Um, it's, it's, it's about one and a half million, Senator, actually, but that doesn't matter. It's, it's materially the same. And approximately half of those, um, uh, we could have delivered high-speed tiers using GFAST. So one on and a half network. million are? Around about half of those. Oh, sorry, uh, about half of yeah, those. Yeah, I don't have the exact number, but it's about, it's about half, John. Yeah. Right. It's, it's, about, it's about half. Um, but, but sorry, Sandra, you keep... So why only half when, back in 2018, Mr Morrow said one and a half million premises would be on that network with fast, uh, I'd, with GFAST in I'd, I'd have to go back and have a look at what he actually said, but, but if I can... I'd have to answer a different way. Um, there, are, there are two types of equipment in the fibre to the curb footprint. They're similar, but they're two types, and they're consciously provided by different providers, which is a... The diversity of supply we wanted to have. Um, half of those um, deliver what's called VDSL, which is the upgrade of ADSL. Um, uh, the other half do VDSL and GFAST. So what we could do is replace some of those what's called distribution point units or DPUs that, that do VDSL with GFAST enabled. So that may be what was in Mr Morrow's mind, but what, what I'm, and again, I'd have to read the quote, but, but what, um, what, what, I, what I'm telling you is that around about half of the yeah. DPUs no, is, is GFAST yep. and the other half is, okay. is what's called VDSL. 
So is every premises in the FTTC footprint still being supported by BDSL2? Um, yes, it is, because the, because the GFAST enabled um, yep. DPUs also do VDSL. So is GFAST going to be used to deliver the one gigabyte speeds? In the FTTC mm. footprint? Um, I don't think so, Sandra. May, there may be some, some cases when we would, because... Why, why wouldn't you? Are there technical problems? No. Um, I, think, I think when we, when we looked at this, Senator, we had... Um, <clears throat> I guess we had three choices. We could leave the footprint as capable of delivering 100 megabits per second, or we could look at, we could look at enabling those customers who wanted a higher speed using GFAST or using a fibre lead-in. Um, but when we looked at when we looked at the long term, and I'm talking, I mean we have we've built a network to enable everyone to get to a minimum speed. Now, if we're going to provide higher speeds beyond 100 megabits per second to people, we wanted to look at the long term, the 15-year roadmap, if you like. And within the within the uh, if we, if we were to deliver, sorry, and I should also say we have already pulled fibre to outside someone's home, so it's close. So the fibre is close close to the home. Um, what we, what, when we looked at it, we, we took the view that um, using VDSL, there's, oh, sorry, using GFAST, there would still be things like copper remediation, there may be still some home wiring in the home, and it was also going to be um, IT system bills for us and the retailers, and a harder, a harder thing for retailers to manage because they'd have to explain what service they were getting. So we concluded that the best return on investment for those, was for those customers who wanted more than 100 megabits per second to provide a fibre lead-in. Now, now, Senator, I will say, in the background, you asked me about GFAST, in the background, there may be times when it makes sense for us, invisible to retailers, to still use GFAST. And if you, if you want a technical reason, John can answer that, but effectively would enable some homes to get that 100 megabits per second. So we're not completely abandoning it. Okay. But in the yeah. vast majority of cases, we, we provide, for those customers who want more than 100 megs, we've concluded the best solution for them is to provide a fibre lead. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, look, I'm, I, I just want to um, keep moving because I'm very conscious of time, and I am conscious that Ms Dwyer is sitting there, and yeah. I'm happy for her to 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 go because I and know she has a plane. Sandra to catch. Green, are you okay with Catherine leaving as well? If there's and, anything else we need, we'll. And Sandra Sheldon and as well. And you can't notice. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Ms. Ryan. Thank you. Thank you for coming under difficult circumstances. Um, uh, so, Mr. Rue, why is Inbianco having uh, now having to upgrade premises to fibre to the premises in order to deliver speeds of 250 megabytes per second? In the fibre, which, which area? Sorry, Sandra. In the FTTC. In FTTC. Yeah. So, um, everybody in the F <coughs> everyone in the FTTC area is able to get, or the vast, I should say, the vast majority of customers in the FTTC footprint is able to get speeds of up to 100 megabits per second. So what, what we have done over the last decade is build a network out. I'm glad we, I'm glad we did, because um, it, was, it was basically completed when COVID hit us. But what we, what we have been doing uh, under the statement of expectations, has been building out as fast as we can across the nation to get to a minimum minimum service for everybody. In fact, Australia is one of the only countries I know of our size that has universal access to everybody of high speed of high speed broadband. The next stage on any organisation like ours, any technology company, is what follows that, and there will be over time customers across the country who, who will be able to, who will want to enjoy and will have a need for more than the minimum speeds that we're providing mm. in various footprints. So in this case, fibre to the curb. Can so, I just wind you back to, yeah, sure. um, in, in September 2020 at the National Press Club, the Minister for Communications um, told, said then that GFAST would be used to deliver giga, gigabyte speeds over FTTC. So why wouldn't you use that capability if it's already in the ground because, for, be, say, 750,000 yeah. homes? Yeah. So are you saying that it doesn't work properly? No, I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is is that the when we, when we looked at the long-term return on investment, over, uh, in other words, over a 15-year, say, period, for the, the best solution for those customers who wanted more than 100 <coughs> megabits per second was to provide a fibre lead-in. GFAST absolutely could have delivered 
that's that certainly at a, it certainly could have delivered 250 megs and above that it, as well. It can't. Or it can. could absolutely can. Right. So there's, it can there's no technical issue. There's no technical issue with GFAST, but right. as I said in my answer earlier, when you consider the fact that fibre is close already to the home, yeah. when you consider the fact that there would be work like copper remediation for these are the customers on the highest speed here, things like home wiring, IT system bills for retailers, we concluded that the best long term. Uh, and this was, uh, again, I'm not here to, to talk me half the minister, but this would have been after that um, yep. event that, okay. she, uh, I don't know so, where it was, I can't so remember where you said it was, but after that event. That so, so the minister said 750,000, well, no, he didn't say 750,000. That's a rough that's number. The, that's a rough that's number. That's the rough yeah, figure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many premises are you assuming will take up speeds of 250 megabytes per second or more within that FTTC footprint? Over I what? I mean, is, is Over the what assumptions... Time? Over what time period, Senator? Well, I guess, is the assumption similar to the fibre to the um, network overbuild, roughly one in five by, say, 2024? 20, no, I think it would be... Or do you I, expect I, a higher take-up in, no, in FTTC? I'll ask Mr Wickham to comment on it, but it'll be less than that, because the, there are customers in... Remember, in fibre to the node, where we're building fibre in the street, those customers... There will be customers who cannot get 100 megabits per second, so some will want to go that to can't, cannot. Yeah, that cannot, yes. Can't, and yes, so okay. with the, they now will have the opportunity, if they so choose, to be able to purchase 100 megabits per second right. speed too. So, but, so then sorry, Sandra, but the but fibre to the curb, yep. the whole of that footprint can already do it. Okay, so therefore, so, I so think how many lead-ins? Can I can I just ask you? This is my final question on yep. this sub, yep, this sure. topic. How many lead-ins for? FTTC premises do you expect to build by 2024? Um, I don't have that, Senator. I'm in the middle of preparing um, a corporate plan. So uh, I hate to say this, but can you, can you hold that question? Can you hold that question, Senator, the next Senate hearing? Because we'll have done our plan and I'll be able to answer that. that case. Uh, well, I'm asking you now. What do well, you expect well, to build? We're, we're currently do, building up those sort of assumptions for the next corporate plan, Senator. So I don't have it here today, nor is the, nor is the corporate well, plan completed. Can you take completed. it on notice, Mr. Roo? I'm Roo? very happy to take it on notice, but we will. I, what I can tell you is, and th that assuming the next Senate hearing is after the corporate plan release, we'll be able to answer that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Just, uh, just want to. Um, Look at this question about. Uh, I just want to ask a question about um, the lead-in conduits and potential practices by NB and Co to undermine competitors. As I trust you're aware that leading and building lead-in building conduits (LICs) are essential for the delivery of fixed broadband services to corporate enterprise customers in commercial buildings, as they are physically connect street infrastructure to a building. Without access to these last segment of the conduit, an infrastructure owner cannot connect to the building or must undertake civil works to dig its own lead-in conduit. The ownership of almost all existing Telstra lead-in conduits have now transferred to MB and Co. Telstra still gets to use the fibre they have in the lead-in conduit, <coughs> no cost, as per the definitive agreements and the MBN charges other access seekers to assess. Now, for the benefit of this committee, can you explain how the MB and Co's current charging structure for lead-in conduits differs to Telstra's existing charging structure? Do you want to take that one, Beth? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't be qualified to say how it differs. Um, we do, as you mentioned, we have taken possession of those lead-in conduits. We do offer those uh, lead-in conduits on commercial terms. Uh, we are, of course, a user of those conduits as well, so we need to set aside capacity for ourselves, but we do make them available to other participants in the telco industry. So, just so when you say you can't, is somebody else able to give me that answer or about the, um, yeah. explain okay. how, the, how the difference between the Telstra existing charging structure and what NBN so the, Co? So, the, the, so Sandra, the Telstra, the, the Telstra, what, what we call as DAs or de definitive agreements, was set um, back in 2011 and then was revised in 2014 as part of the setup of NBN. It was a separate commercial arrangement between NBN and Telstra that enabled the, the start-up and, and effectively NBN to, um, uh, to, to come into existence. 
And th those, those definitive agreements cover things like access to exchanges, access to docks, access to dark fibre, and there's a range of charges that was agreed back in 2011, and, and as I said, amended it at a, on, on the change in policy in 2014. Um, that, so, so that's a it's a it's a it's a agreement that very long, and um, that was agreed between the companies at that time. What we're talking about here, is, as Mr. Wickham said, is is where we have either either. Um, taking possession of those leading conduits, or in fact sometimes we build, we, we repair them or we build them some ourselves, we, we offer them out to third parties on commercial terms. Um, and and that, that's what Mr. Wickham was saying about. So I guess when you ask me what's the difference, one is, one is a long-term standing agreement that was part of the original setup of NBN, the other is, um, uh, which had its own commercial terms, the other is arrangements with third parties with us to provide access to those leading companies. Uh, thank you, Mr. Roo. Uh, can you confirm MBN, in practical terms, is now the owner of the last 10 to 50 metres of conduit? Um, in some cases. Some I mean, cases. we're not in every single commercial building. So where we are in, so the answer will be, mm. will be no. John? I'm not 100% certain. Yeah, there will be, there will be yeah. buildings that we don't have access yeah. to, Senator, because either they were um, uh, what was called adequately served, or they're part of corporate buildings that win that they win might win of access. Part of body corporates as well, yeah. which um, yeah. in the old um, uh, uh, infrastructure provisioning that was done by Telstra, they would sometimes take the network just to the boundary point, and then the actual development beyond that boundary point, and all of the assets they would be owned, be owned by the body corporate, not by Telstra per se. Have you got a, um, an assessment of what that? what it would practically look like um, on how much of the 10 to 50 metres of conduit you would be well, likely to be in your so remit? To, it, so the answer, Senator, depends on the premise. So if it's, yes. if it's a premise that we've built out to, yes. If it's a premise that's, as I said earlier, adequately served and we haven't built to, or if there are nuances like John talked about for, for, multi, for MDUs, we call them multi-development units. And believe me, they're all different. Some are horizontal, some are... At all. So um, it depends, Senator. If you're talking about houses as opposed to MDUs, we would have the vast majority. We would own the vast majority of those. But it, it's it's not the whole country. Right. Does this mean that competitors must now negotiate deals with both Telstra and MBN before they can deploy infrastructure into a building? Um, to the extent that, we, so they would they would have commercial arrangements with with Telstra. I've got, and I have no, as you'd understand, on, um, knowledge of that. Um, where they need a lead-in conduit into a, into a premise where we have we own that lead-in conduit, as as Brad said, we would have commercial arrangements for that piece. So, the, so the commercial there'll be some commercial arrangements you have, but you're not quite clear whether it's whether it's oh, maybe mis misunderstood. You're not quite clear whether there's arrangements for all circumstances. Is that? It, 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 well, no. To be clear, where we where we own. Or have built, or have upgraded a leading conduit, um, and somebody else wanted access to that. There are there are um, formulas applied, if you like, to ensure that that MBN gets a uh, is able to cover the costs of providing that to a third party. Essentially, um, what happens with the Telstra conduits and third parties, I, I can't comment on, sir. So why has MBN Co imposed a 100 metre per connection purchasing requirement on access seekers? I think conceptually because the, the first metre is the most expensive metre and so in essence it's sort of a minimum mobilisation charge. Um, it's just a practical way to get around the fact that it, it costs a lot to mobilise to get out and get access to the, to the lick. So why, is, why are access seekers being forced to buy 100 metres, in some cases, of leading conduit, when in many instances MBN Co don't even own the 100 metres of leading conduit, and the access seeker doesn't need 100 metres? As I said, it's just a pricing mechanism. It, it represents what the cost is to get out there initially to get access into that lick. So they're paying for 100 metres even though they're not getting it or don't need it? Well, you could look at another way, is they're paying to get access and the first 100 metres is free. Well, I mean, certainly the way that it's actually presented um, from MBN Co is that there's 100 metres uh, of leading conduit 
which needs to be put in by NB and Co. Um, and the 100 metres of leading conduit and the access seeker, it doesn't need in some circumstances the 100 metres, but you're charging for it. Well, we're just going in circles. I think, as I said, it's there, there's a minimum charge to get out and access it. Making a point. My point is that there's a minimum charge to access the lick, and you get the first 100 meters included in that. Why, why don't we, why don't we um, take on notice your question, Sandra, and lay out exactly how it works? So, so it may be an easier way for you to. You, you also, that would be, would be of assistance as well. Yep, I'm oh, happy to do that. Sandra. Can you confirm that the MBN Co's commercial offer is between three and four times higher than the previously priced access seekers had contracted with Telstra? Um, I don't know the answer to that because I don't know what the previous contract was, but what I do know is is that we have uh, commercial terms that ensures that we um, cover the cost of providing additional, uh, effectively additional services to people. That's so, Senator, I can't tell you about what previous arrangements would, would you, were. Would you be concerned if it was three to four times higher than the previously priced access seekers? It, it would depend because... They contracted the, with... It would depend because if we have put in... In many cases, we have... So, so the leading conduits, it sounds like we just acquired them um, from Telstra, but often they needed repair, they needed work done on them, and John, I don't know whether you want to comment, but there was... There is, in many times, we have had to incur capital to ensure mm. that that leading conduit... Uh, uh, works appropriate, works their own work, but provides the access that's needed. Mm -hmm. So, to the extent that there is capital incurred by us, you would expect us to have a recovery on that, where we where we're providing access to yeah. third parties. Yeah, but John, do you want to I mean, expand on that? So many of those licks or leading conduits are, are just so old, Senator, that there is always remediation in many many um, examples that has to be undertaken. So. Um, so it's only fair and reasonable that we would recover our costs. Thank you. Chair. OK, so just confirming that uh, We'll put complaints. the rest of that questions on notice. Terrific. Case, thank you. Mr. Thank Ruta, you. you and your team, thank you very much for not, all, uh, not you, just Dan. your evidence today, but what you've been doing to support Australia, uh, its business and community groups throughout the pandemic uh, thank you. and in their normal life. Now, you have agreed to take a number of things on notice. Yep. Friday the 9th of July is the date for the return okay, of... OK, so Senator, we'll have, we'll have the answers back. Yep. Derek, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I will